I read a book once that was called Diary of a Rock and Roll Star <laughs> by Ian Hunter. And it was just like, uh, it was the brochure at the time. You know, it was like the brochure of how I want to be. It ain't the way I want to be now, but it was then. My very first ever memory is a musical one. It was like seeing the lifeguards band marching down Mitcham High Street. And I must have been very, very young then, two or three. And that was my first ever memory, you know. And uh, my mum used to be like a big Elvis fan. And when I was growing up, the Beatles were just starting to happen. And uh, the Kinks and the Stones, you know, those groups were sort of around. They were on the radio. I remember Len Barry's One, Two, Three as that being a, a tune that I heard all the time. You know, it's kind of one, two, three, it's so easy, you know. <laughs> I thought that was what life was all about. <laughs> I went to school in Brixton and uh, for the first two years or so, um, I was really good at school, you know. I was really good at religious instruction and um, oral English and all things like that, you know. And then, like, music came along. And there's a time when you make a choice between football or music or you just do what everybody does, you know. I mean, you ain't going to get out and you just like, no, you ain't gonna get out or you have to make yourself get away, you know? And it was like, a lightning bolt had hit me and said, you have to go and do music, you know? You have to be in a group. That was it, really, be in a group. I was the right state in those days, because it, like, the only groups that I really liked were like things like the Stooges and the New York Dolls and what was in those days, that was punk music, you know, and it was like garage music, you know, and they were the things that really excited me. And there was so little information we got in this country on this sort of thing, so I had a kind of a weird viewpoint of where it was at. So I used to wear, like, women's high-heeled shoes and, like, a uh, sex shop that was going at that time, and uh, I used to have their T-shirt on, you know, so it was that kind of mixture. It was like, in my mind, it was to do with the New York Dolls, you know, and uh, I was sort of worked like that, and uh, everybody used to, like, taking a mickey out of me, you know. But it didn't used to bother me because I just didn't care in those days. And uh, I wanted to get a portfolio together in order to go to art school because I thought that was what, what you did, you know. How you got in a group was you go to art school. Like, Pete Townsend had done that and uh, Keith Richards and John Lennon and uh, I think Ray Davis too, you know. They'd all been to art school, so I thought that was what it was all about, you know. You went to art school and met other people who was like-minded and you'd form groups of them, you know and that you'd be practicing in the toilets, you know. So I was like, first day I rushed to the toilets and see who was there. And uh, there was like, you know, two guys having a fag. It was, it was really disappointing. But I stayed there for four years while I tried to get my, what, you know, because you get a grant, don't you? I was on the painting course, but I painted everything. We used to paint our amplifiers, we used to paint our shirts, the, what with the wall behind us, the floor, our ties everything we used to paint and so like my art school teachers used to say have you done any paintings recently and I'd go and I'd show them my shirt you know and but it wasn't sort of acceptable so I got chucked out in the end and I went back for the, the last day you know when they have the show for when you go out and get your diploma or what have you and uh, it was like a space instead of my stuff so I, I never got to have that I moved in with my nan to a council flat and uh, I lived there right up until I was 21 or something. Uh, I used to go, I'd go off at times and live elsewhere, you know, there was a squat just around about the time when the clash was starting in Shepherd's Bush and we used to all live there, you know, and uh, things like that. But that was like my spiritual centre. It was the 18th floor up on the Harrow Road. And, uh, you know, I mean, not that we should make a big deal about, you know, because that's how most people live, you know, they live in council flats. They don't live in flash pads like I've got now. You know, that's that, no big deal, but um, it, what it had was a great view of London, you know, because I was so high up. And we wrote a lot of songs up there, you know, London's Burning. We used to be able to look out over the Westway and all the lights would shine, and that sort of was London's Burning, you know. <laughs> and I always, always used to come back there, you know, to my nan. I don't know why, but uh, because I loved her so much, I think but also I didn't feel ready to live on my own or something. And it was like, I was a, like a bloody rock star, you know, and uh, 
I was still living in this council flat. I was like 21, the most happening group in the country, if not the world, you know. And most nights I'd be up there just sitting there watching the telly or just doing regular stuff, you know. Tony James was like, I was, I was illegal. He was my best, best pal at the time. And we were sort of learning together, you know. And uh, we played in a group together for a long time. And all the guys at that time, because we put an ad in the paper about anybody who's into the New York Dolls or Iggy Pop and the Stooges or the MC5 should get in touch with us because at that time there wasn't anybody in the whole country who was, knew about this music, you know what I mean? It must have been a handful of people. And we put this ad in the Melody Maker week after week in the Monotony Maker. It was really boring. And uh, we, we heard from incredible people, you know, that have done stuff since. Uh, I remember Morrissey used to write to me, this guy from Manchester, Stephen Morrissey, you know, who was really into the New York Dolls. And he probably doesn't even know this, but he wrote to me, and I always remember I've got the letters, you know, and Brian James came to us, the guy who got the dam together. We gave Rat Scabies his name, because a, a mouse came in the, in the studio, the rehearsal studio, and he had Scabies on that day, so we said, Rat Scabies, you know, yes, it, it stuck. One day, it just all clicked, you know. Uh, we were walking down Portobello Road, and uh, we bought these ladies' car coats. They were about 50p each, down the, the, the khaki end. And uh, three of us, Keith Levine, Paul Simonon, and myself, we put these ladies, bright blue, bright pink, and beige, you know, these three car coats on, 50 pence each. I just looked around and thought, wow, this is a group. This is what a group looks like. You know, and that was it. it. And Joe Strong was around playing the pubs in the 101ers, you know. And we met him in the street. And after we, we used to go see him play and that. And he's obviously showed potential, you know. And so um, we said, we like you, but we don't like your group. Why don't you join us? <laughs> Bernie, the manager, was really responsible for a lot of the way that we thought about how we put ourselves across, you know. He never gave us any money, though. That was the big problem. So we, we were still, like, living, subsisting, you know. It was a big joke, even in the music papers and that, that 50 quid a week, that was our wages, you know what I mean? And it was, like, it was a like well-known fact what we earned was 50 quid a week, you know. And it was, like, it was a main bone of contention in the group a lot of the time, apart from food. You know, we used to argue about food. I remember one time we, had, we spent an evening fly-postering around Camden Town, you know, you know that paste that you make up yourself with flour and water? And uh, we had a bit left over when we finished and Paul was start really starving. So he got this saw, an old saw, and he put the paste on the saw and he heated it up over an electric grill. And you know what? He ate it afterwards. And I didn't do that. I wouldn't do yuck. I wouldn't do that, but he did that, you know. So that was kind of like, we really learned to be like, well, I thought it was going to be all girls and, you know, fast cars and stuff. And it wasn't, nothing like that, especially with our group. And it was not, none of that, none of that groovy business or nothing, you know. It was like, we missed it. Well, when we played at Bonds, we played for like, I don't know, 17 or 18 nights on Times Square. And um, it was, it caused a big fuss, you know, and they had like people spilling out into the street and they hadn't had that since Frank Sinatra and the Bobby Soxers and uh, we caused a real sensation going into the heart of New York. Bonds is an old department store you know and they've converted it into a kind of a Studio 54 type nightclub you know and uh, we had the huge clash banner and it was like dropped over the front of this Bonds sign you know and it was on Times Square and the people were going mad and the, the police were on their horses and, all that and they were cancelling it because of fire hazards and we had to come back and play other nights and it was a really wild time and we were trying to do something you know and like trying to get a foot in the door and the, and the groups were like boring and real dinosaurs and i know they're around still you know and they're still it's kind of the same thing now what it's like what it was like then you know what i mean and it just needed that push and it came and it was great we all flooded through you know once you had a foot in the door it was just a matter of pushing. We were very intense uh, as a band, you know. We used to cry together and we used to fight each other. And we were that passionate about it and we all believed in it, you know. And we would have died for it. 
Well, it all started to go wrong, actually, when Topper left, right? Uh, Topper left, and it was never really the same. But we, we could have carried on, but then I, I, got, I got fired, so... <laughs> uh, but we'd really stopped communicating by that time. We just managed to just maintain a grunting level of civility, you know, before. But it was kind of all set up as well, you know. I was kind of set up, really. And that was a lot of kind of political behind the back, you know. People were moving and like trying, being influential on different people and coming between members of the group, you know, things like that. All the, start, all the things that start happening, you know, when you become really successful, you know, you, you become a different kind of asshole. I turned up the day I was fired and got my guitar out, you know, and uh, I think it was Joe it was who managed to muster up the courage to say that he didn't want to play with me anymore. And when, I, when somebody says that to you, you know, that you just, I just pack my guitar up and just, well, hey, you know, okay, bye, and that was it. I walked, and Bernie come running out after me with a check in his hand, you know, like a gold watch or something, you know, which added insult to injury. Well, I took it anyway. And about two days morning, and I started on the next group. Big Audio Dynamite was formed on the dance floor, if you like. That's how I saw it. I saw it the same as how I saw it in the first days. Um, I saw Don and Leo standing in a club, the two dreads in the band, right? And they're my friends, anyway, right back from the punk days, right, where Don was the DJ in, in the Roxy Club and Leo worked behind the bar. And uh, I saw them and I went over and put myself in between them. You know, they were both standing there with dark glasses looking really cool and I went and sort of said, you know, kind of, let me get in there, fellas. And I kind of stood in between them and I looked again at both sides and thought, Hey, I've got a group. Ah, I think that when we first did our first LP, there was uh, quite, like, people thought, what was this? You know, they kind of think, they saw the cover and people thought, oh, he's got some dreads in the group. He's going to make reggae records, you know. So he used to come out and uh, I used to have, like, a funny kind of Paddington bear hat and a, a really long shirt and uh, sort of, sneakers, you know. Uh, it looked really ridiculous and when we came out and we were playing this this music, uh, this is even before we had the record out, we did some gigs, you know, and uh, we just made a horrendous racket and we were like the first people in this country to have samplers, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, if I hadn't have been in, got involved in Big Audio Dynamite, no one would probably have heard of them, you know, because that gave us, like, uh, it gave us an advantage, me being in The Clash and that, obviously, because I got a, to get off a, a later starting point, you know. I was like in the, in the lead anyway, so they didn't have to do that work again. But um, it was a disadvantage as well because people didn't really think that I was capable of anything else other than what they knew me for, you know what I mean? And like, we had to like, you know, people would come and they would shout for the old songs and stuff, you know, when we used, and I'd like, well, we don't do those ones anymore, we're doing this now, you know. I think all groups, need to be some kind of dictatorship or you need to have a leader you know and uh, I'm, I'm the leader now and uh, it's a benign dictatorship if you like and we all we we like to think it's a democracy really and anybody can say what they like you know and uh, everybody tries to join in and, and contribute as much as possible really to everything every aspect of it you know if I can't write a lyric Don will write it or you know, if I can't figure out one bit, uh, somebody else is going to come up with it. You know, it's like back down to that thing of being a group and depending on the other members of your group. I, I guess I don't really see myself as working in the, the medium of pop music as you like. I mean, I know I make popular music, but I don't, I don't, it's not about a formula to me, you know. I don't, if, I, say I've had a hit record, right, then I don't try and do this. You know, like people do the follow-ups and it sounds the same. You know, I don't like to do that. I don't like to stick to one thing. It's about, to me, it's about breaking the limitations. You know what I mean? It's about breaking the barriers, trying to go forward, trying out new things. And so, sometimes they don't work, and sometimes you look like an idiot, you know. I've been really, like, influenced, like, even though I wasn't even there, 
by the what's been happening in Acid House now, you know, it's like, but it's not like, and you know, all the groups say, you can't make an Acid House record, right, which I'm not anyway, but they don't want me to because they think that it, everybody will laugh at us, you know what I mean, for jumping on last year's bandwagon, you know, it's like flaccid. <laughs> but it's not what I'm interested in, I'm interested in the next bit along. I don't earn enough money to be a tax exile in the Virgin Islands yet. Then I am going to be, you know. But I do expect everybody to still think of me the same way. I want everybody, to, like, say when I'm in a big pink Cadillac, and I'm driving, like, down Notting Hill Gate, I want everybody not to act any differently towards me. I think it's, like, really important that everybody's just, like, I can lean out of the limo and just, uh, say hi. Morning,